As the program says, I'd like to talk very briefly about DNS in the context of all the discussion so far about v6 and the future of the Internet. Um, I, I should explain the expression, rebuilding the airplane in flight, is uh, sort of common around our shop to talk about any major technology transition because that's often what it ends up looking a little bit like is uh, <coughs> making sure you don't break anything. You're supposed to make everything better, but you're not supposed to break anything which um, is inevitably quite the challenge. I'd like to first introduce, real briefly, ISC and myself. Um, <coughs> ISC is a nonprofit. We produce production quality implementations, open source software of um, network infrastructure protocols, principally DNS and DHCP. We do have a DHCP that's v6 compatible, um, thanks to funding from Comcast. Um, we're very proud of that. Um, but here I'm mostly to talk about DNS and uh, v6 compatibility for, for DNS. Um, for me, I joined ISC in 2002. Most of my job now is business development. Um, I also spend a lot of my time on public policy work with Aaron and ICANN. And uh, I look a lot at the policy pieces of making IPv6 happen. And I have to say that I've become increasingly convinced that really only operators can do it. All the politicians can do is wait for us to screw it up. <coughs> so to the fundamentals of DNS and what it means to you. Um, briefly, everybody's familiar with it. Everybody uses it every day. Um, I was a little surprised to see DNS called an application because I've been doing this long enough that uh, I think of it as infrastructure. Um, technically, DNS is a protocol for managing updates and lookups to a database that's widely distributed, loosely consistent, loosely coherent, supports a whole bunch of different record types and data. Um, operationally, it's how people get to your content, and if it breaks, a lot of other things stop. The pieces of DNS that are involved with IPv6, there's really two pieces and they're separate, which isn't always obvious. There's the process of publishing an IPv6 address to correspond to a name. That's referred to as a quad A record. It's just another name in a DNS zone. It's a resource record you can query for. Um, the other separate piece is v6 transport, and that's what we've been talking about all day. Has, has, does the host talk v6 to something that's listening? Um, there's behavior that it still takes an expert to understand or predict as far as some of the details of address selection, gating, translation. Um, typically, a named server with v6 transport will answer on the same interface the query came from. It's important to remember that the authoritative server for a zone has some control over which address records to send and not much else. So most of what has to happen for DNS to work is as decentralized as all the, as DNS, sorry, as internet architecture has become and for all of the reasons we've been talking about all day is limited control in the hands of the authority server maintainer for managing v6 aspects. So v6 availability of DNS names. The root will have quad A records published for those servers prepared to answer queries over v6 transport on, I believe the date is February 4th. Um, many of the TLDs have quad A records. Some registrars are beginning to support quad A records for names lower down the DNS tree. So if your hosts are reachable by v6 transport, add quad A's to your zone and you're done, right? <laughs> you really are asleep. <laughs> Not quite. And we've been really talking about this all day, but in the DNS context specifically, are there routes to you over v6 transport? Are there routes back from you? to your query source over v6 transport. How good are they? A whole bunch of tunnels linked over 
routes provisioned by people that are still experimenting is of uncertain quality. And it's very, very difficult to tell from where you're sitting as a content provider of DNS or anything else, how good is the path to you, how good is the path back. What do clients do with, host, with v4 and v6 host records when they have both? Um, there's a lot of ways for this to become pathological that you, again, have no direct control over. Um, for that reason, um, RFC 3901, which is a very brief BCP on provisioning DNS in a mixed world, basically recommends don't plan on doing v6 only anytime soon. Do v4 or do dual stack, but make sure you are not trying to field production service based on name servers that are only v6 reachable. And add the quad A's after you're sure you know what you're doing. Um, I was asked specifically um, to talk a little bit about, as kind of a case study, um, the root name server we operate, known as froot, um, why it matters, and uh, what exactly we're doing to provision v6 service. So I actually came in here this morning thinking it was four, but actually it's six of the root servers will have quad A's in the root. Um, those operators are VeriSign, ISC, WIDE, um, the U.S. Army Research Lab, and the RIPE NCC. Um, so they're, they're the pioneers, and uh, we'll, see, we'll see how that works out. Um, DNS has been one of the things people mention as an obstacle to V6-only networks or to high-quality mixed networks. So, frankly, we're about to take that excuse away from them. You know, we don't expect many will use the service at first, uh, but we do believe in the long term here, and it's not going to get any easier if we wait longer. So before we could deploy v6 service for the root, there were a number of issues to consider. Some of them are specific to DNS, some of them are specific to the root, and the fact that if you change things in the root and something breaks, people like me and people like David Conrad in the back there um, get yelled at a lot um, because everybody in the room notices, the entire planet notices. Um, without going too deep into DNS protocol, you know, specific concerns, um, there were a number of questions to be reviewed first um, before recommending quad A's in the root. Um, the analysis is documented in a report um, from the ICANN Root Server Advisory Committee and the Security and Stability Advisory Committee. Um, with a, these included primarily backwards compatibility with clients that wouldn't recognize a quad A record, um, and some concerns with the size of the list of root name servers, including names and glue, as packed into a DNS reply packet. And you know, we can go into as much detail, you know, if somebody has specific questions, but it's basically backwards compatibility and making sure that people that are v4 only and going to be v4 only forever don't have problems because we've added quad A's for the root name servers. For us as an operator, we had all the obvious set of concerns. Um, host provisioning, connectivity for production service, connectivity for troubleshooting and administration, um, and security. Because as somebody pointed out earlier today, um, the bad guys are early adopters. They're, they're thinking of bad things to do with v6 before most of the world has even heard of v6. Um, so we have all the standard security concerns that we have with any high profile important infrastructure service. And we fully expect people to invent new ones. Operationally, we learned you know, quite some time ago that um, we buy a lot of good things by using Anycast. Um, and it's part of our plan for doing v6 without breaking anything. Um, the word means different things to different people. Um, but here's what it means to us as operators. 
All, all NACAST is is injection of the same route into the routing table from multiple separate points, identical content. Topologically, this is identical to a single well-connected site. Um, what this adds is redundancy, um, DDoS resistance. It allows us to contain attacks. Um, it also adds troubleshooting complexity. You know, the trade-off has been well more than worth it, but there, there are some real issues, and it does, uh, it does raise the bar a bit. The way ISC does any cast on FRoot, a number of the root servers actually deploy any cast. Um, everybody's architecture is slightly different. We think of that as a good thing um, because everybody has a slightly different set of resources, slightly different set of preferences about how they do their, their provisioning and management and so on. And the more different ways we have of doing this within good practice, um, the less likely it is that one set of bad guys will be able to do a bad thing to all of us at once. Um, the way ISC does it is a two-tiered model. And we actually have a tech note that you can find from our website that goes into detail about the routing protocols and the, the, how we set this up. But we have a couple of very well-connected global nodes. And those are at major facilities, multiple transit providers, lots of peers where places like PAX and AMSICs, um, and a whole bunch of local nodes that are at exchange points and major colos that we primarily interact by BGP peering. <coughs> the routes are propagated, no export. Um, this improves latency for local clients. This has enabled us to really spread a lot of benefit and a lot of um, improve the service to large areas of the world that have good connectivity within their own area without necessarily having good connectivity back to us. So this has actually allowed us to improve the quality of the service dramatically. Um, and turns out in some degree to be very suitable as islands of IPv6 spread. So it's kind of a bonus. So how are we doing v6 without breaking anything, besides very carefully? Um, v6 transit on our global nodes is as good as we can make it. Um, we've got multiple providers to each location. Um, we've got a lot of services within the same facilities, um, some of which we've been making available over v6 for um, longer and for wider user bases than uh, we expect with the root at first. Um, We've got a dedicated address block from Aaron. And we're rolling out the local nodes as capabilities become available. Um, all our hosts are dual stack capable. We're adding v6 peering as available. Um, in some places, the invitation to peer with a root server is the first excuse people have had to turn up v6 at a peering point. And we're sincerely hoping to see more of that. We're, we're sincerely hoping to be a driver of at least people experimenting and trying out v6 connectivity and the usefulness of v6 connectivity. In some places, we won't, we won't do the production service without native connectivity, which is easier with the local nodes because it's, we just have to peer. Um, in some places, we're resorting to tunnels for administrative access. Um, in some places, we only have v4 administrative access. So where are we starting? From day one and beyond, um, we've got v native v6 transit to our global sites. 15 out of our 38, if I counted right on our website this morning, um, 15 of our local sites will offer v6 service. Um, more details about that at f.rootservers.org. Um, we will initially be able to log complete query data for future research. Um, we have no way of telling how long that will be feasible. I hope it stops being infeasible sometime before I retire. Um, but this is a historic opportunity to really watch a major technology transition from the get-go. You know, There's a whole bunch of data we don't have about what it looked like when we 
deployed the V4 internet that it would be kind of nice to have about what it's, gonna, what it's going to, to look like as we deploy the V6 internet. Um, we know for all the reasons we've already talked about that this is not going to be perfect. Um, we'll probably find problems and make compromises with V6 service initially that we don't make with V4 service. Um, we'll get phone calls. We'll have troubleshooting to do with people that never had to spell quad A before. Um, in some cases, it's possible that things are going to get worse before they get better. Um, to some extent, as a nonprofit, we ha we've justified going ahead with this in a way that some commercial guys can't. Um, we are here for the greater good, and it's got to be done, and we believe strongly that waiting is only going to make it harder. Um, so we are uh, ready with production service, and it'll be really interesting to see how it goes. And I think I'm almost out of time, so we can do questions now or later. Um, this is something that could be taken offline. Uh, sure, happy but, to. But let me just ask. I'm always happy to gossip about Dan. Uh, sure. <laughs> How about, oh, gossip about the ICANN board. I haven't heard a thing uh, since I stepped down. <laughs> um, that's okay. Uh, Harold lets I'll me know anything important. Um, if you're a resolver... And you're sitting in an environment where you have both V6 and V4 capability and somebody hands you a DNS query and you're going to go off to do something. Let's suppose for the sake of argument that uh, you are going to a V6 root server, one of yours. Mm -hmm. So you launch this, this query in V6, carried by V6, mm -hmm. and you get back a response that leads you to think that you need to go to another um, server. A referral, yeah. But it happens to be one that only responds with V4. So are the resolver, is the resolver software already known to understand that it need, may need to switch back and forth between V4 and V6 um, uh, transport because not all of the servers will necessarily be capable of both flavors? So we, don't, we don't start the process out by saying it's all going to be V6 because the first query was V6, do we? No, we don't. Um, each... Specific is, right, is independent and it has to do with it, and that's going to be determined by the address selection on the source of the query, okay. rather than the data content of any response it gets. What you hope is going to happen is the resolver is going to see quad A's and A's, or it's just going to see A's and say, "Okay, I'll okay, query okay. over V4." Thank you. People will find a way to break this, just because they always. Oh, do. I'm sure they will. They and always we're, do. We're, we're looking forward to it. Okay, go for it. Thank you. Thank you.